This is the skeletal lab, and this one is probably the longest one the entire semester. So if you're going to do this in one shot, you might want to put on a pot of coffee or something. We're going to see there's all kinds of stuff we have to cover in this one. So our first diagram is just a, a simple generic osteon diagram. Hopefully you've done the lecture by now and so you know what an osteon is to begin with. But we have to label the parts of it here. So let's start, I guess let's start on the very inside here. There's a little piece of the bone here that looks very different than the rest. This is the spongy bone, which so what you're seeing here are the spicules. The rest of it here is the compact bone. So we're going to label the parts of the compact bone. On the very, very outside, this, this membrane on the outside, this is the periosteum. This circular unit is an osteon. These kind of dark dots on the circles are the osteocytes. Those are the cells that are making the bone. In the center of an osteon is this hole, but it's not just a hole. It's actually a canal, and that is the central canal because it's in the center of an osteon. But you see that there are also canals that connect the central canals. The ones that go sideways are the perforating canals. So that would be this here. Pulling out one osteon, the layers, we see cartilage here. And then in the center of the osteon, running through the central canal, we have blood vessels, the red and the blue, and a nerve the yellow. Next we have some slides of compact bone and a couple cartilage slides that you've seen before, but we'll go through them again. because Now we know a little bit more what we're looking at. And so this is compact bone. The circular unit is the osteon. The black dots are the lacuna in which the osteocytes live. The lacuna is the little pocket that the osteocytes live in. The lamella are the rings running around the tree. The canaliculi are the lines that radiate out from the center. And then the central canal is the large hole in the center. Make sure you fill in where you can find compact bone. Then we have two types of cartilage, actually three, because there's one on the next slide. We have hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. So if you look at this slide, number one, we have chondrocytes. Chondrocytes, remember, are the cells that make cartilage. Again, kind of like the osteocytes, they live in the lacuna. And so when we look at this, these bubbles, they're not actually bubbles. They're the lacuna, and then living in the lacuna, are the chondrocytes, and then what's outside of the lacuna is the extracellular matrix. Next is the elastic cartilage. Again, we have chondrocytes. These are the cells that are making it. Then we have elastic fibers. These are the dark purple lines here that you don't see up here in the hyaline cartilage. The extracellular matrix is everything else around that. Now, the hyaline and elastic cartilage looks very similar. Hyaline cartilage tends to be a slightly lighter color purple. Elastic cartilage is a little bit darker, has the dark elastic fibers in it, and it tends to have a few more cells. The cells in this one are a little more dense together than they are in that one. Then there's the fibrocartilage, which looks very different because this one stains blue. This one kind of looks like wavy water. So again, you're looking at chondrocytes. So we'll find the nuclei. Those are your chondrocytes. The blue waves are the collagen fibers, and everything else is the extracellular matrix. Next, we have a generic long bone that we need to label the parts of. So we're going to start on the right-hand side here. So remember the center, the shaft of the long bone, is the diaphysis. And then on each end, we have an epiphysis. In the epiphysis, 
we have here, we're saying this is an adult bone, and so these are epiphyseal lines. In a child, they would be epiphyseal plates. You can see one here and one here. Because this is a femur, and so this head here would fit into the hip, this is the joint. And so on the, the part of the bone that goes into the joint, we're going to have articular cartilage. In the epiphysis, in the center, we have spongy bone. So that is this area here. And then this little, di this little line here is pointing to what's living in the spongy bone, which is bone marrow. Coming down to the diaphysis, here we're pointing to the outside part of the bone, which is the compact bone. This is pointing to the open part in the center, which is the medullary cavity. This is pointing to this membrane that kind of lines the medullary cavity. So this is the endosteum, whereas this is the periosteum. Periosteum is on the outside of the compact bone. The endosteum lines the inside of the compact bone. Make sure you answer those questions and then we really start getting into the, the main part of this lab which is memorizing bones. We're going to start with the skull and the skull has a surprisingly large number of bones that make it up. The easiest one is the forehead. The forehead is the frontal bone. We're going to come back to that a number of times because not only will we have the frontal bone, but we'll also have the frontal lobe of the brain. On the side here, this is the parietal bone. In the next diagram, we'll see that the parietal bone is actually much larger than it looks looking from the front. And then on the, on the side, a little bit lower, we have the temporal bone. Between the frontal bone and the parietal bone, is the coronal suture. The way I remember this is, remember, frontal and coronal plane are the same. And so the suture that goes along with the frontal bone is the coronal suture. Then between the parietal bone and the temporal bone, we have the squamous suture. And unfortunately, I don't have a good way to memorize that one. The bridge of the nose the bone part of your nose is the nasal bone. The light blue here, which is the cheek bone, is the zygomatic bone. To me, that one always sounds like it belongs on an infomercial. And then we come to the jaw. The jaw is made up of the top part and the bottom part. The top part here is the maxillary bone. The bottom part is the mandible. This is the moving part of your jaw. Then we turn the skull to the side and we can see some of these bones a little bit better. Again, we have the frontal bone in the front here, and then between that and the parietal bone is the coronal suture, and here is the parietal bone. And so you can see that this is much bigger than it looked in the last one, and there's actually two of them. There's one on the left side, one on the right side. So you're only seeing one of them here. This is the temporal bone. It's on the, think of the temple of your skull. Between the parietal bone and the occipital bone, which is the one in the back here, is the lambdoid suture. Uh, let's come back up front. And then this, this little purple bone just behind the eye socket and in front of the temple is a sphenoid bone. We'll see more of that once you take the actual top of the skull off. Here's our nasal bone again, along with our zygomatic, our maxillary, our mandible. But the mandible here, we can see where it actually forms the jaw joint. And so this here is pointing to the mandibular condyle. The mandibular condyle, condyle is this little bulbous part that fits into the jaw joint. Just behind the jaw we have this little almost spike that sticks down. This is the styloid process. 
This is kind of buried in your skull. You're not going to be able to feel that on yourself. But just behind that, just behind the ear, is this large process. This is the mastoid process. And this you can definitely feel. If you just put your finger back behind your ear, you'll feel a large bone that kind of sticks down. That's the mastoid process, which is part of the temporal bone. And then this hole in the temporal bone is for your ear canal, but the hole in the bone is called the auditory meatus, which to me always sounds like it should be a band name. I don't want to hear see you naming your band that because I already called this. Next, we're looking at the top of the skull. So we have the frontal, the parietal, and the occipital. Here you can see the two parietal bones. Because this is the frontal bone, this is pointing to the coronal suture. Between the two parietal bones, running lengthwise down your skull, is the sagittal suture. And then here is the lambdoid suture. Next, we're kind of going to kind of look inside your face at your sinuses. The sinuses are basically empty spaces in your skull. And so we're going to learn where they are and their names. So first of all, we're kind of looking superficially. We're looking at the face of a person, and we're kind of coloring places that the sinuses are located. But remember, the sinuses are deeper in the skull. They're not right on the surface. So kind of on your lower forehead, between your eyes, are the frontal sinuses. Kind of around your tear ducts, we have two of them. The red ones, the upper ones here, are the ethmoid sinuses. The lower ones are the sphenoid sinuses. And then the large ones on your cheeks, the ones you can maybe really feel when you get a cold or something, are your maxillary sinuses. On this diagram over here, we're looking at the same thing, but we've turned sideways. So now we can really see that some of these are much further down in the skull than other ones. These are the frontal sinuses. Kind of up in the nasal cavity here are the ethmoid sinuses. There's some very large maxillary sinuses here. And then the sphenoid sinuses are way back in, in there. Next, we take the top of the skull off, and so what you're looking at is the floor of the skull. So here, we're going to see some of the same bones we saw before, but we are going to see some features on them that we hadn't previously seen. Up front, we still have the frontal bone, but this kind of teal-colored spot here is called the ethmoid cribiform plate. And then you see in that structure, we have what looks like little holes, and that is actually what they are. The holes are called cristagalli, and they're actually kind of little channels that nerves can stick down through, little fingers of nerves can stick down through into your nasal cavity. And so when you breathe in air through your nose and you're smelling it, you're smelling it because the nerve coming from your brain, which is sitting towards the back here, comes here and sticks down into your nasal cavity. The blue in the center here is the sphenoid bone, and in the center of the sphenoid bone, which kind of has a butterfly shape to it, the body of the butterfly is called the cella tersica. Our manual spells tersica with, a, with an S. If you find it someplace else, you may see it spelled with a C. They're both correct. Moving a little bit further back, you see the purple on either side. That is the temporal bone. The kind of flesh pinkish color, one on each side, is the parietal bones. The green in the back here is the occipital bone. And then in the occipital bone is this very large hole. The Technical term for a hole is a foramen, and this is a very large hole, and so this is a magnum foramen, or the foramen magnum. This is where the spinal cord enters and exits the skull. And so remember, imagine the brain sitting up in the skull, and then the spinal cord has to go down through the skull, down the, spine, down the vertebral column. 
So it's going to pass through this large hole here. You've got some stuff to fill in on your own here. And we'll move down to the vertebrae. So we have a number of different types of vertebrae, and they're all shaped a little bit differently. So we're going to start over here on the left, and right now we're just looking at a diagram of what would be a generic vertebra. Okay, and so we're going to point to different parts of this, and most of these parts are going to be on most of our different types, but we'll get into specific ones in a minute. So first of all, the main part of our vertebra down here is the body of the vertebra. This is the, the structural part of your vertebra. Up top here, this is the spinous process. If you look at a, a diagram or a picture or a, a model of the spine, you see that there's all these little spinous processes sticking outwards. So towards the back, away from the, your, your thorax. And so this is the back of the vertebra. This is the front or the anterior portion of the vertebra. This large hole here is the vertebral foramen. This is where the spinal cord is going to run through. We have some little spikes that stick sideways. This is, or they are both transverse processes. And then you have these little cups here, and it looks like a little bit of cartilage on them. Those are the articular facets. That's where the vertebrae are going to fit together, and where when we bend, they're going to slide against each other. So that is a generic vertebra. Over here we have the atlas and the axis. The atlas is the first uppermost vertebra in your vertebral column. So this is the one that links the rest of your spine to your skull. The axis is the second one. You might hear, might hear this one called C1 and this one C2. They're both in the cervical region. And so that's C, and this is the first one, so C1 and C2. This one not only has the very large vertebral foramen in the center, it has these smaller ones off to the side. These are transverse foramen. And then the axis has this one extra little bump. Uh, this is actually sticking upwards rather than outwards. And this is called the dens. Next, we have our three main types of vertebrae. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can see them all at once. So these are the cervical thoracic and lumbar vertebrae, you need to be able to look at a picture of a vertebra and tell me if it's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. Okay, We're going to talk about the differences between them. The most obvious is cervical is the smallest, lumbar is the largest, thoracic is medium. But not all cervical vertebrae are the same size. Not all thoracic are the same size, not all lumbar are the same size. In general, as we go down our spinal column, the vertebrae get larger. And so the second, or maybe let's say the third cervical vertebrae is going to be larger than the second, and the fourth is going to be larger than the third. And so the last cervical vertebra is going to be only a little bit smaller than the first thoracic vertebra. So the size isn't always the best thing to go off of here. Cervical vertebrae are the most flexible. The thoracic vertebrae are not very flexible at all. And the lumbar vertebrae are somewhat flexible. And that makes sense. Our neck and our lumbar region bend, but we don't bend the thoracic region of our spine very much because we have the ribs there. Ribs there. We just can't bend there. We bend above that and below that. So let's look at these and figure out how we can tell them apart from each other. What I do is I look at the articular facets. And so if we look at them, we can see that they're pointing in different directions. So in the cervical vertebrae, they are facing upwards. 
So you're looking down on this vertebra here, and the articular facets are facing upwards at you. On the thoracic, they are facing posteriorly, back towards the spinous process. And then in the lumbar vertebrae, they are facing inward towards each other. So to me, that's the key. Up, back, or in. That will tell you, are you cervical, thoracic, or lumbar? So we're going to move down a little bit. Next is the chest, which is mainly the ribs. But the ribs come together in the center of your body and attach to the sternum. So these, this is the sternum, but there are multiple parts to the sternum. The main part here is the body. The uppermost part, which attaches to the collarbone, is called the manubrium. And then this little point down at the bottom is called the xiphoid process. Then over here we're looking at our ribs, but we actually have three types of ribs, and the classification on that type depends on how they connect to the sternum. First we have a true rib. The top uppermost ribs are the true ribs, and these attach directly to the sternum. Down towards the bottom of the rib cage we have what's called a false rib. So this one is pointing at a false rib, and if we follow it, it goes from bone to cartilage, and then that cartilage actually attaches to the cartilage of another rib before it attaches to the sternum. If it does not connect directly to the sternum, that is a false rib. Then down at the bottom, we have ribs that don't attach to the sternum at all, and those are called floating ribs. Back behind the ribs, we have our shoulder. So this is the pectoral girdle. So what you're looking at here are two shoulder blades. So you're looking at the front and the back of a shoulder blade. And my suggestion is when you first see a shoulder blade is figure out how this is oriented. Because if you just see a picture, you, you have to figure out, are you looking at the anterior, a posture, you're looking at the left one, you're looking at the right one, and the key is always to find this little cup. This is where the arm attaches. So that's going to be the outside of the shoulder blade. To me it seems kind of easy to look at this and just seem like, feel like this should be the outside and this is the inside. I don't know why, just when I look at it, it just seems like that's the way it should be, but it is not. A little cup here which is called the glenoid cavity, is where the arm is going to attach. And so, it says we're looking at the anterior part, and this is the lateral portion where the arm is going to attach. So this is the right, the right shoulder blade, the right scapula. And then we have two little arms sticking off here. The one sticking out towards you here, is the coracoid process. And then here we have the acromion. So the coracoid process is on the anterior portion, the acromion is on the posterior portion. Now we're going to look at the posterior side of it. And so here we see the acromion a little bit better. And then this part of the acromion is called the spine. Next we have to label these. And this is looking at the lateral and medial border. And so remember lateral is outside, medial is inside. The lateral border is going to be where the arm attaches, which is here. So this is the lateral border. This is going to be the medial border. Moving down from the shoulder, we get to the arm. The upper arm has one bone called the humerus. So this is the anterior and posterior view of the humerus, which is what this label is pointing to. It's pointing to the bone as a whole. This is the humerus. And this is the head of the humerus, which fits into that glenoid cavity. Down on the distal end of the humerus, 
we have the capitulum here and the trochlea here. Flipping it over, looking at the posterior side, we see this little cavity here that's called the olecranon fossa. So that's the upper arm. The lower arm, the forearm, is made up of two bones, the radius and the ulna. So here, this on the left-hand side of your diagram, is the radius. Right-hand side of your diagram is the ulna. At the top of the radius, where it forms a joint with the ulna, is the radius head. Sitting at the very top of the ulna is the trochlear notch in the olecranon. So over here we had the trochlea and we had the olecranon fossa. So these are going to kind of mesh with the ulna at the very top with the trochlear notch in the olecranon. Continuing on down we get to the hand and the wrist. So the wrist is made up of a number of short bones and those are the carpal bones. Then we have the fingers. Attached to the wrist are the metacarpals. When you're looking at a skeleton, to me again, it's kind of easy to imagine these as fingers. When you look at your hand, those are your fingers. But actually, this is in the palm of your hand. The metacarpals are in the palm of your hand. If you feel it, you can feel your fingers extend down through the palm of your hand and attached to your wrist. Only these three outermost, or distalmost bones here are what you think of as your fingers. And these are the distal, I'm sorry, these are the phalanges. We have the proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. So now we could do basically the same thing with the lower limbs. So instead of the scapula and the shoulder, we have the pelvis and the hip. So what you're looking at here is the right hip bone. So your pelvic girdle is going to be made up of two of these connected at the pubic symphysis. And there are uh, several bones here. So the uppermost large blade looking part here is the ilium. And the very, very top of the ilium is called the iliac crest. The purple on this side over here is the ischium. This little bump on the ischium is the ischial spine. This area down on the bottom of the ischium is the ischial tuberosity. The red is the pubis. The pubis is the bone that's going to bear the weight when you're sitting down. And then the hole in here is the obturator foramen. Then we get to our leg. And the leg bones are very similar to the arm bones. We have one in the upper leg and two in the lower leg. Instead of the humerus, which is in the arm and the leg, we have the femur. The femur and the humerus can be a little difficult to tell apart. The big telltale sign is the femur has a, has a head on it that sticks out from the bone. If you take a look at that. I'm going to scroll up and look at the humerus. Here the, the head is right on the end of the bone here it sticks out. So if you see this you know you're looking at the femur. So this is the head. Over here on the lateral side we have the greater trochanter. On the medial side smaller we have the lesser trochanter. Over here in the lower leg we have two bones. The smaller one here is the fibula. The larger one is the tibia. Top, on the medial end of the tibia, we have the tibial tuberosity. On the distal end of the tibia, we have the medial malleolus. 
and on the fibula we have the lateral malleolus. So that should tell you that the tibia is the medial bone here and the fibula is the lateral bone. Then we have the foot which is like the hand and so we have instead of a wrist we have an ankle and the bones that make up the ankle are the tarsals. But the ankle, we have two specialized tarsals. The upper one here is the talus. That's this. And then the lower one here is the calcaneus. And this is your heel bone. If you make it into open lab and you're looking at a skeletal a model of the foot, I can almost guarantee you it's going to feel natural to flip this foot over and have this calcaneus pointing upwards, thinking that's going to mesh with the lower leg. That's not the case. The large calcaneus goes down. So where we had the metacarpals here inside of your foot, we have the metatarsals, and then we have the phalanges, the proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. On the last page here, we have some things that you're going to need to do on your own. We're not going to really cover them together. First, we had some terms that we used throughout when we were naming those bones, like a process or a head. Those terms refer to different shapes on bones. And so what I want you to do is find an example of each of these structural, what we call structural markings, and write that down. Next, you need to be able to figure out are these bones, long bones, flat bones, irregular bones, or another type of bone. And so make sure that you're not only able to tell me what type of bone these particular ones are, but if I just show you a picture of a bone, whether you know which bone it is or not, can you tell me whether it's a long bone, a flat bone, a short bone, or an irregular bone. I should be able to give you any bone. It could be from something other than a human. Just by looking at it, you should be able to tell me which of those four types it is. Finally, go online, find a diagram or a picture comparing the male pelvis to the female pelvis, and then write differences that you see. If I show you those two two next to each other, you should be able to tell me which is the male, which is the female. The female is going to be a little bit wider, and it's going to have a larger uh, kind of triangle shape at the bottom. If you find the picture, you'll see what I mean. And then finally, there's just a couple extra questions down here. Hopefully you're still awake. Maybe the coffee was working. When you're done, you've got all of this filled in. Make sure you fill every little bit of it out. Then you can turn it in and move on to our articulation slide. If you have any questions, let me know.